Welcome to the Lightworkers Lab, a podcast for spiritual people who want to go deeper, aim higher, and design truly extraordinary lives. And now for your host, intuitive coach and spiritual teacher, Crystal Ann Compton. Hey everybody, it's Crystal and welcome to the Lightworkers Lab podcast. I am really happy to be here. I've been having an awesome week. I don't know about you, way better than the week I was having in that last episode. I just, I feel really good. I think it helps that I'm not walking around in 100 degree weather here in North Texas. I'm so over that. Goodness gracious. It's about 70s now and it's lovely. I can actually go outside for an extended period of time and that sunshine just really helps, doesn't it? Really helps to get out in nature. And speaking of nature, I just want you to know that I am here with the illustrious, however slightly unintelligent, Koa Shane Saw Compton. He's my great Dane, my oldest. He's fabulous. He's handsome. However, he's also been slightly mauled by his even bigger brother, Kubert Compton, who apparently is getting a little jealous that Koa is receiving love from mommy or daddy. Who am I? Who am I kidding? I'm looking at my husband over there. Who am I kidding. My dogs love my my husband and I'm just an afterthought unless I'm cooking. But he's here with me now. I'm taking care of him. He's such a love bunny, but he also groans a lot, you know, as he's just shifting around. So if you hear that, it's not me, it's him. But we're both here to answer the questions that you've been sending in. And I just want to say, your questions have been really interesting. They're not, how do I phrase this so that you understand what I'm saying? They get me going. Like they cause me to think. I love any type of information, any type of new knowledge that I haven't heard about before. If I can take it into a session with my my guides, or if I can take it straight to spirit and see what I can come up with and look around my own library, oh my gosh, I love doing that. And so a lot of you are asking really top tier questions and I am digging it. And there are also a lot of you asking timely questions, asking questions that a lot of other people want to hear. And then there are those, of course, who are asking questions about their personal life and things that are going on in their day in and day out. And I want to encourage everybody out there to send me these types of questions so that I can answer them here on the Lightworkers Lab podcast podcast. Howevers, and listen up, you have to do it the right way, people. You have to follow the instructions. And the good news is that there's a link to those instructions right in the blog post featuring this episode of the Lightworkers Lab podcast. So go to the page on the instructions and then write me at Tuesday Questions at crystallandcompton.com. That's Tuesday Questions at crystallandcompton.com after following the instructions and then I'll go through these questions and I'll put together the next awesome podcast. Speaking of the next awesome podcast, when should that be? (laughs) I think it needs to be next Tuesday on the dot at 10 a.m. You know why? Well, because a lot of you wrote me. A lot of you wrote me and said, hey, where's the... Where's the Lightworkers Lab podcast? I had only done two episodes of it. And in fact, that second episode on my website got more attention than probably any of my other blog posts all year, which is shocking. Those blog posts are awesome. I spent a lot of time on them, y'all, but just one podcast and a lot of you seem very interested. And you know, that's the way spirit works, at least for me. In fact, actually for all of us, we're just not always paying attention. But for me, wherever there's energy, you know, wherever there's an uptick in attention or focus or people are talking about something or showing me something, that's always an indicator for me that I need to pay attention and that I need to be moving in that direction. And to that end, I am definitely picking up what you're throwing down. I even got a letter from one of my best friends in Chicago, Illinois. How you doing, Julie? And go Cubs. Go Cubs. But she's like, what's up? Where's the Lightworkers Lab? You started this thing and, and what, are you, what are you doing? And you're right. But can I just let you in on something really quickly? Everybody, 
I do all of this myself, and no less, I'm in a walk-in closet. <laughs> I'm sitting here in a walk-in closet, and when I am done with this podcast, I'm going to have to upload it to my computer, and then I'm going to have to pull up the audacity, I'm going to have to load this track, I'm going to have to edit it, and I'm so annoying, I have all these ticks I have to edit out. That's going to take me a long time, and then I have to upload it, and then I have to write the blog post, and I'm just complaining, aren't I? All right, I'll stop. I love what I do. I love what I do, but it is a lot of work, and thank God I finally have help. I finally have some people in place out there who are going to help me with some of this, although I have not yet found an audio editor. Does anybody out there know how to do that? That would be awesome. But I do do it all myself, which is the reason I didn't put up the episode last week was just, I could, I couldn't. I couldn't, but I get it. I need to, and I will. Well, enough about me, people. Let's get right into your questions because, again, they're awesome this week, and I want to answer them. This first question comes from Chito, C-H-I-T-O from the Big Island of Hawaii. And she says, my question will probably be a strange one, but here goes. I was raised in a Christian home with the belief in speaking in tongues. I witnessed this many times as well as the interpreter giving his or her interpretation. It seemed to scare me as a child. When I was about 11 or 12 years old, I went to church camp where I experienced this firsthand and was the one speaking in tongues. The situation took place in a large hall where the speaker asked anyone who wanted to come kneel at the altar to give gratitude to the divine. So I did, and all I kept repeating was, thank you, over and over, until something seemed to take hold of my tongue and I spoke another language. After becoming an adult, I tried to find out exactly what this was. I became a very spiritual person and set aside all religions. I've had many experiences where I've been given dreams or information which comes true. I've always felt that maybe I'm supposed to channel. Is there anything that spirit can tell me about this experience and what it should mean to me today? Well, the reason I chose this question, Cheeto, was, well, there's just so many commonalities. First and foremost, I was raised on the Big Island of Hawaii, and I also came up in fundamentalist Christianity. Specifically, I came up in the Assemblies of God churches, which are Pentecostal churches, very charismatic. In fact, if I was ever going to be in a church as a psychic person, the Pentecostal church is probably the most psychically evidential church of them all. This is the church where we have people routinely standing up and prophesying or laying hands on other people to heal them or getting slain in the spirit or, like you've just described, speaking in tongues. I also chose your question because I actually experienced something very similar when I was about 13 or 14 years old. I was on the big island and I had gone to Kona, which was on the other side of the island, to a big youth retreat or big youth conference. And there were people there who were attempting to teach the kids who had gone to the conference how to speak in tongues. Apparently they thought it was something that didn't necessarily need to be inspired by God, but that they could teach you the beginnings of it and then you could take it and run, I guess. All I remember is that these people told me to say shama, lama, ding dong, and then (laughs) kind of just keep going and speak in tongues. And, And I tried it. And for For me, that experience was very awkward because it wasn't authentic. It wasn't sincere. I was doing what people told me to do who were trying to force some sort of a divinely inspired event. Now, what you've described, however, sounds different to me because what you are describing is what I really think tongues is. And tongues is essentially a light language. Our light language is the language of our soul. It's the language of our spirit. And when the soul is crying out to source energy, or when the soul is being grateful, such as you were, or when the soul is seeking to connect to source energy, often there will be accompanying inspired utterances. And as human beings, of course, we have language. You know, our soul doesn't speak English, it doesn't speak French, it speaks soul, it speaks source energy. 
and as humans with our language, the deeper we go into our reverence, the deeper we go into our inspiration, the deeper we go into that connection with source energy, the more we access the soul and the language of the soul. And so our English language begins to shift and change the more we make that connection. That's what I believe tongues is. It is the language of your light. It is the language of your spirit. Now, what happened with you actually reminds me of the story in the Bible, and it's the story of the prophet Samuel's mother. She was married to a man who had another wife or another couple of wives, and they were pumping out babies like it was their job. <laughs> but she couldn't seem to have a child, and this really brought her a lot of sadness and a lot of grief. And so there's this passage where she goes to the altar and she just kind of throws herself down before the altar and she just cries. She just lets it all out and it goes so deep within her that witnesses observe that her language changes and it goes from a prayer with her native tongue into something that perhaps they thought was angelic or could not recognize. And what Samuel's mother was doing was accessing this aspect of her soul in order to communicate with the creator and transmit to the creator what her deepest desire was. And so her soul is petitioning to bring in this new life. And we see what that life ultimately turns out to be. And she does ultimately have a child who is the prophet Samuel. The reason that passage has always struck me though is because it's a great illustration of what light language is. She accessed her soul language through deep despair, through seeking comfort in source energy through reaching out and asking for what she truly desired and what she truly felt in her spirit that she wanted to bring into manifestation. That's how she accessed the channel. The good news is that we all have access to that channel. We all have a soul and that soul has its own language. Our spirit is always connected to source energy. It is in fact the umbilicus that extends from us all the way to the higher self, and then beyond to source energy. We are already hooked into source energy, and this is the channel through which we receive information from spirit and through which we transmit information to spirit. And when we get really deep into that connection, the energy that's transmitted or transferred, especially as we are transmitting it, can cause these types of utterances within us. And so I do think that you are speaking in tongues. I personally wouldn't call it that simply because it it has these ties to fundamentalist Christianity. I would call it light language, but I don't think it matters what you call it. I'd like to tie it in now to you referencing being a channel because you said you always thought that you were supposed to be one. I do think your ability to access your soul's language or to activate and begin transmitting along that channel would indicate that you could potentially be a channel. And I think it's also interesting, Cheeto, that I'm a channel too, and that's one of the main things that I do. And I also spent a lot of time as a youth speaking in tongues. Now I'd like to qualify that and say probably about 95% of that was absolute gibberish and bollocks, and I was really just trying to figure it out. But 5% of that? Yeah, 5% of that I do believe was my light language. Now, so much older and having various ecstatic experiences and spiritual experiences, I have found myself speaking in tongues. It's always jarred me out of the experience because it reminds me of speaking in tongues and I start observing myself and I, I really throw myself off. My hope is that at some point in the future, when I am in that state of ecstasy and when I am in that state of of deep communication with spirit and my utterances begin to change and my prayers and my worship and my communication begins to shift and the words start to become something I don't understand or recognize, I hope that I go with it. Because remember, sound is energy. Sound is also a conveyor of energy. It is moving energy around. And when you're that tapped in, when you're channeling at that level, you are working with powerful, anointed, high vibration energy. And if you ever can access it again, and if I can ever access it again, I suggest we work with it to see where it takes us. 
Excellent question. I really love it. Thank you so much for writing in. You've reminded me of my childhood and you've also allowed me to do a little work on myself. I have to admit it. You know, for the longest time I had judgments and even anger about Christianity and even Christians because of all the things that I had been through. But more and more these past few years, I've been confronted with experiential truths or gnosis truths. These are truths that are true to me. And it's striking how many of these truths and experiences resemble experiences I had so many years ago within that system of faith. And so I'm coming to a new reconciliation and it's really cool. And I hope that you do too. All right, let's move on to our next question. This next question comes from Rory K. in Orlando, Florida, and Rory says that she used to have recurring dreams when she was a kid, and in these dreams, small little beings would be standing at the foot of her bed. Sometimes she would actually see them entering the room, but they would be coming through walls and coming through windows. Rory says she's now in her 40s, but recently she had the same dream, and it was almost exactly like the dreams that she'd had as a child. And she wants to know what I think about that and whether there's any significance there. Well, that's a great question, Rory, because what you're describing here sounds like a classic alien abduction, and I don't want you to freak out. The reality is, is that Many of us have interdimensional contact with interdimensional beings all the time. It's just that we don't remember. Interdimensionals have a way of accessing our energy and pulling us out of our form or out of our physical body and then taking us somewhere else in order to have experiences with us. Sometimes we can be conscious within those experiences, but most times we're not. This is interesting, though, because you've actually seen the little beings. And if they're little, this makes me think that they are greys. And greys are commonly thought to be the Zeta Reticuli. Now, the Zeta Reticuli, a lot of people have a lot of different ideas about who these beings are. Most of the opinions would indicate that the Zeta are negative. I don't really hold the same view because just like humans, there's a range within the being itself. There are some Zetas that are service to others, just as there are Zetas that are service to self. However, it does appear that the greys at this time on our planet have a bit of an agenda, and I think they are currently doing a variety of different experiments on humans in order to preserve their own race. Now, this is a lot, and I don't want to go into the entire thing, but let me just tell you that there's information out there that would indicate that the Zetas, or the little greys with the big eyes, are actually future versions of humans, and they're time traveling. They are time traveling back into our time, and they are abducting people women and men, in order to reproduce with them. I don't know if you've ever heard of a gentleman named Jim Sparks, but he's a writer. He's got a book or a couple of books out there. But he describes the experience in a way that I think is really credulous. And if you haven't heard of him, you should really look into him. But he was abducted all the time, and he would get so mad because he would be conscious for most of it, and they would take samples from him, samples of his sperm, and they would mix that with Zeta ovum or Zeta beings, I don't quite remember, but the point was to create a hybrid species, so part future human and present human, or part Zetas, part greys, and human, because the Zetas are dying out. The theory here is that Zetas have mastered technology at the expense of their own emotionality. So they're not emotional at all. They don't have feelings. They don't really understand fear. They don't really understand love, etc. They're here for their own agenda to do their own thing. And so I went into this long explanation of what these beings remind me of because what you're describing is actually really, really common. And I would recommend another book for you. This book is called Taken by author's last name is Turner. I always want to say Kathleen Turner, but that's not it. But look it up. It's called Taken, last name Turner. And she interviews a bunch of women about their various abduction experiences. And I think you're going to see a little bit of yourself in some of these recountings. Nonetheless, let's get back to the fact that you've had a dream that is almost exactly like the dreams you had as a kid. 
The first thing I want to tell you is that it's probably not a dream. You are observing these beings with your astral eyes. Your physical body slept, but your astral was aware and saw what was going on. These beings have the power and the technology to make sure that you're completely unconscious and make sure that you don't remember the encounter. And so it's curious to me that they're allowing you to be conscious to some degree as these encounters occur. And again, these interdimensional encounters are much more common than you would think. Now, remember a little bit ago, I mentioned that the Zetas don't have emotionality, that they built up their technology at the expense of their emotionality. And as a result, when confronted with our emotions, such as fear, which many people feel when they have or when they observe these encounters, when they experience that, it does not compute. Recently, I was reading a book by Stuart Wilde, and he described his own interactions with greys, and he said what he ultimately did to make them go away was love them. You heard that right. He just loved them. Now, he wasn't scared of the Zetas or the Greys, but he was tired of them. He was tired of being woken up night after night to have these weird encounters. He just wanted peace. And so what he decided to do was project a beam of love energy directly at them the next time they entered the room. And that's exactly what he did. And he said they got out of there immediately. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know how to handle it. And so if you're at the place right now where you already know that you don't want to have these encounters, I encourage you to start training yourself now to project that beam of love. Muster the love in your body and learn to direct it or to express it out from yourself. Because that is the beam of energy that you're going to want to be sending to these interdimensionals to make sure that they leave. But always remember, Rory, you do not have to be afraid. You have dominion in this dimension. You have control and sovereignty. There is no other being, interdimensional or otherwise, that has the right to interlope or interject or barge on in to your physical experience. When you own the dominion, when you know that you have a dominion, you can express that energy as well and they will respect it. And so to conclude, I don't think what you have experienced all your life is in fact as a result of a dream. I think these are actual encounters, and if I were you, I would begin to take control of them. This next question comes from Michelle, also called Ginger Snap. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm snapping Ginger Snap. <laughs> She writes in from Crane Hill, Alabama, and she says, My question is about a message that I received. I've never heard the phrasing before. I was told that I am a guardian of the white light. I know that I'm supposed to be of service. I'd just like to know what it entails. Okay, so you got a message, presumably from something like a psychic or a medium or a spiritual person, and they said you were a guardian of the white light. This could mean a lot. I'm assuming that you already understand what the white light is, but because some people out there might not have heard of the white light, let me just explain. The white light essentially describes the light of source energy or the light of God. We can also call this divine light or celestial light. White light is extremely protective. In fact, it's often used in protection rituals. If you're feeling frightened, if you want to bless your house, you can flood it with white light light and that will do the job. White light, however, also implies light work. And your last sentence there is, I know I'm supposed to be of service. There you go. That means you're a light worker. And so what you really want to know, I think, because I think you know what white light is. And so you know that you're supposed to be of service in the light. You just don't quite know what to do. And so what spirit is showing me is you palms out. Okay. Put your palms out in front of you. I want you to send your consciousness, and this means your attention and your focus, into your right hand. That's all you got to do is just think about your right hand. Anybody out there who wants to do this, you should do this too. Send your consciousness and energy and your awareness into your right hand. Do you feel anything? Is it starting to tingle? Stay there a little while. See if the tingling begins to grow. I'm thinking it's going to begin to grow, and I'm thinking that, and they're showing me that you're going to have a bigger response doing this exercise than most people, and they're showing me right hand over left. What does that mean, spirit? All right, let's send our consciousness into the other palm for a little while, and let's just check it out. Let's focus. Let's send that energy into, I'm sending it in right now to my left palm. Okay, this is not as strong as the right palm for me, but what are you feeling right now, 
The reason they're having me do this is because they're showing me then taking your palms, which have these like light bulbs in them, and the right one is brighter than the left at this time, but you can work on that and bring this into balance so that the left one is strong as well. And they're showing me lifting your hands like lights and waving them in front of people. And what you're doing specifically is you're waving them within their grid and you're waving them within their field. And so as you do so, things are being aligned and things are also being repaired. Okay, here we go. This is the reference that Spirit gives me. It's from Minority Report when we see Tom Cruise using that holographic computer screen and he's just swiping and things are moving around and he's adjusting it. I was just talking about this actually to a friend of mine recently, but I see you doing stuff like that. So you're adjusting energy. Okay, so you're an energy worker of some sort. It doesn't feel like you're a lay your hands on them and they're physically healed, kind of an energy worker, but it does, and, and I don't think it's Reiki either because I'm not seeing those symbols. It feels like it's attunements and adjustments. It feels like you're doing specific work within the chakra system, the aura, and that's feeding into the overall field and the grid. Girl, welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. If I were you, I'd start having a dialogue with Archangel Metatron because Archangel Metatron is combing the earth looking for people like you, especially people who can deliver attunements into other people. This is something I can do. Many of my students also can do this. And I think this is something that more and more light workers are going to be able to do. I too can adjust and manipulate energy using my hands, but I do it more using my voice. I could actually stand in front of you and say a word and I don't know what the word will be. Sometimes it's like light language. I don't even understand it. It's not about the word. It's about the resonance and the vibration. And I can speak that word and it will be inserted somewhere in one of your systems, somewhere within your grid. And then you get an adjustment and you are now able to receive at a higher level. You are now expanded. This feels to me very similar. And I am running into more and more of these light workers on the planet. And I think that this could be part of what you're being called to do. You would benefit greatly from some foundational psychic training and understanding. I tell my students all the time, if you wanna be more psychic, if you wanna be more connected, if you want to be enlightened, do this first, fellowship. Hang out with people who are a lot like you, people who are seeking, people who are curious, people who are into metaphysics and spirituality. Next, study. Read all the books that you can, preferably on things that interest you, but even if they don't, read. Reading is a method through which spirit is able to convey information, knowledge, and energy into our systems. Some of it sticks, some of it doesn't, but what does stick tends to be eternal. Next, you have to develop those spiritual practices and disciplines. This means you've got to meditate. I need you meditating 20 minutes to 30 minutes, at least three to seven times a week. I know that's a lot, but that's what you got to do if you want to work on your light work. I also want you to be praying, which we just talked about. I need you to be communicating with source energy and your emissaries. Your emissaries are your angels, your guides, your ancestors, etc. And within your emissaries, there are always theme guides or theme angels. These are angels that are there very specifically to help you get what you need to do what you got to do. So if you're a light worker and if you're supposed to be working with energy, then you have in your entourage, if you will, an angel, a guide, an ancestor, a friend in spirit who is there to help open you to this new facility. So talk to them. The next thing that I recommend if you want to become psychic, stay psychic, or just become more enlightened and open is to change the way that you eat and also start to hydrate yourself. Water is a conductive. That means that water conducts energy. It moves it around. It allows it to be distributed in certain ways. And it's quite possible that you're going to be working with energy. And so if you're going to be routing that energy in your body, you need to have proper hydration. Light workers and spiritual people who are actively seeking need to be drinking at least half their body weight in pure water ounces plus 20 ounces. That's almost a gallon for some of us. And I say if you can do a gallon a day, awesome, but you need to be getting that water in because it helps the body to move the energy and it also helps the pineal gland to wring itself out and remove toxins and heavy metals that presently encumber it. Additionally, you need to start eating some high vibration foods. High vibration foods are always your raw, organic fruits, vegetables, nuts, 
seeds, eaten in season and sourced locally. In other words, sourced from a farm near you. These are always going to be the foods that are highest in vibration. Now, I am not saying you have to overhaul your entire diet. I realize that that's hard, but I am suggesting that you begin to incorporate into your diet at least one meal a day where you're getting in these high vibration fruits, nuts, seeds, herbs, greens, cruciferous vegetables, etc. You can do this in the form of a smoothie. You can do this in the form of a beautiful salad with all the things that you love. You can even do this in the form of a really awesome juice that you make in the morning that you also consume immediately so that it is completely bioavailable and your body gets all of that high vibration. The physical body is such an important part of the process. When we are out of alignment in the physical body, when we're run down and we're feeling sick, that spills into the mental, which spills into the spiritual. So if you really want to move in the direction of your light work, if you really want to pull these abilities into form and create something out of it, or at least just know what it is, then start now working in the physical body and with all the other things I just mentioned, and spirit will lead you where you desire to go. This next question is from Samantha S. from Trinity, Texas. Hey, Texas girl. She asks, I'm torn between my husband and my true self. Is it time to leave? I ask this because I came to the realization that I stay in relationships even past my time and past betrayal, and I feel we're moving in separate directions. However, I've been told by multiple psychics and mediums that he's good for me. I assume, Samantha, that you want me to check in and see what I think about the situation, which is what I did before I began recording this podcast. And I have to tell you, when hooking into your energy, and then by virtue of your energy, hooking in to your husband's energy, I really like him. He's actually a solid person. He's a good-hearted person, and he also truly loves you. I do see here that there's a lack of energy within the relationship. This could be a lack of passion, a lack of communication. There could be a lot of different things that are not quite active at this time. But for the most part, he's a good guy. But you phrased your question so interestingly to me. You said you're torn between this man and your true self. The way you phrase the question implies that you already know that staying in this relationship with this man is taking place at the expense of your true self. And so you feel a diminishing within the self or within the spirit simply by being with this man. And so the first bit of advice spirit would give to you is make sure that's what's happening. Make sure that you're feeling this diminishing as a result of this relationship and not as a result of discomfort in the self, discomfort in the path, or inability to branch out and thrive in ways that you are personally and singularly called to thrive. What they're saying is don't place your discomfort onto this person, onto this husband, onto this marriage, unless you are very sure that that's where the discomfort comes from. And then what spirit shows me are timelines. This is how I I tend to work with my clairvoyance. And these timelines tend to go out a year or two, sometimes five years, but usually not longer than that. And what your timelines are showing me are a lot of different possibilities. And that's always the case in a life. You know, there's always the possibility that we're going to turn left and not right, or we're going to go forward and not backward. And so you have a lot of possibilities here too. You could choose to look at this in a different way, Spirit shows me. You could choose to shift the focus in your life on what is working or what could work or what you could build and grow and away from what you perceive to not be working. And simply by doing that, shifting the attention, shifting the focus, this will give an opportunity for the relationship to self-correct and potentially to grow. However, there are other possibilities. There is the possibility that you separate and leave this relationship. And if you choose this possibility, I'm seeing the number two. This looks like about two years out from now. So it's not going to happen immediately. You're going to really have to have a come to Jesus moment before you make a decision like that. You have to be sure. I know that you know that. Now, this possibility could ultimately culminate in divorce, or you could stay separated and figure yourself out, both of you, and then perhaps come back together. There's a lot of things going on here, but let me give you percentages because I work a lot with them. And what I mean by that is that nothing truly is certain. 
And it's precisely because of these many different possibilities, there's always a different road that we can take. And so I tend to predict in majorities or minorities or percentage points. And what Spirit is showing me is the number 70. That means chances are at about 30% that you won't stay in this marriage and that you'll take a different path, not necessarily something that leads to divorce, but it could. And you know what Spirit just gave me as I'm talking to you? The term hidden gem. Like there's stuff in this guy that is really beautiful and he may not be mining it. He may not be accessing all of that beautiful stuff or all of his potential or all of the great things that could be happening in this relationship, but it really is there. And they're also impressing on my heart this sadness. Wow, this would really impact him hugely and dramatically. Of course, divorce does that, but this would really impact him hugely and dramatically. They're showing me there is a way for you to remain married and also seek other outlets that will cause you to thrive and feel so happy about your life. You can have both and be happy with that, but this requires work on your part. This really does require introspection, potentially analysis and therapeutics. This requires practices and disciplines and teaching yourself to think a different way. This is not a bad man, and this man loves you, and you love this man. Things just need to be revivified or woken up, and I think if you worked on that, you would find yourself to be really happy. So I'm going to have to lump in with those other psychics and agree that he's good for you. One last word. You know, Edgar Casey, who is popularly called the Sleeping Prophet, who was the most famous psychic medium in America and probably the world, once said that if you have a burning question like this, what you want to do is go to at least three psychics and you want to ask those three psychics that question. And then what you want to do is compile the information that you receive from all three psychics. Sift through it and look for the commonalities. And when you find commonalities, those are the things that are likely to be true. This means that these three psychics were receiving through their psychic abilities messages from spirit that would cause them to give you that message. And so you should pay attention. Anything that is not within a commonality may resonate, may not resonate. You can discard it, you can keep it, but it's the things that are repeated that you should pay attention to. And again, in conclusion, I'm going to have to agree with those psychics, but it's your life, girl. Never exchange your good judgment and your heart's desire for what some psychic on the internet tells you to do. You have to follow your heart. All right, let's move on to the next question. This one comes from Janet Garcia or Gaia S. And Gaia S. asks, here's my question. When you love somebody so deeply in this earth plane, will you love them forever, even after this dimension or I'm assuming after this life? You do continue to love the people that you love here when we pass into the next dimension. However, I do think it's possible that the love changes and shifts a little bit. Whereas you might be in deep romantic love here in this life with your husband or with your partner, once you pass, you will still share deep abiding love with this soul, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will feel romantic to you or it will feel sexual to you. But here again, nobody knows, honey. Nobody knows, except for maybe Dr. Michael Newton, who wrote the Journey of Souls book and the Destiny of Souls books. And he's a hypnotherapist. And his main gig is regressing people not into past lives, but into what's happening in the lives between lives. Now, if you haven't read those books, you need to go ahead and do that because those are going to blow your mind. He talks about councils and pods and how we separate into different groups and what it's actually like when we die and before we come back into another life. I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. I often look at my husband, who I know you know that I love. It took me 43 years to find this dude and I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to let him go. And I think, well, when I die and then when he dies or vice versa, is it going to be the same? I know he'll be waiting for me or I'll be waiting for him, but will I feel the same thing? Will they there be a di diminishment? No. There is no diminishment. Love simply changes and transforms. 
And the love that you feel for your loved one on the other side is bigger than the love that you're able to feel for them here on earth, but it's different. And if you were to occupy that love of the afterlife, of the bare soul, if you will, it might actually startle you here in this human reality and in your human form. It, it might even scare you. I've had situations where I have experienced energy from different realms and it wasn't bad, it was very, very good, but it frightened the crap out of me because it was foreign to me. And so don't worry about whether you stay connected because you do. Don't worry that the love will go away because it doesn't, but it's possible that it does shift and it does change. Now, I also want to say before wrapping this up that I've heard of souls and spirits having sexual relations in the afterlife and in the astral. There's a lot of metaphysical stuff out there and I've read pretty much all of it. Well, not all of it, but I've read a lot. I've, I've really explored a lot and I've seen some crazy things and read some crazy things and some spirits who are communicating through channels and mediums do say that they are able to have these types of relations, which would be romantic, wouldn't you think? But I don't worry about it and I don't think you should either. Our next question comes from Daniel in Brisbane, and he asks how he can communicate with aliens. And I actually selected this question because it sort of dovetails or ties in with the previous question we had with the woman who was having visitations or encounters with aliens. The answer, Daniel, is the same answer that I'd give you if you asked me, how do I talk to my angels? Or how do I talk to my spirit guides? Or how do I talk to God? If you want to have encounters with aliens, and if you want to talk to aliens, that is exactly what you have to do. Just talk to them. Have the intention and express the intention. Now, aliens are a little different because unlike spirit guides and our personal angels, they're not just hanging around us all the time waiting to interact with us. We do have to issue a transmission of sorts in order to get their attention and have the interaction. Now, there are a lot of schools of thought around how you might like to do this. Some people simply journal and they put it out there in writing and say, hey, I'm ready to have contact. And over time, they'll have the contact simply because they transmitted it through thought or through writing. Other people actually memorize their coordinates, like where they are, longitude, latitude, and they, and they, they memorize these coordinates and then they project them up to an interdimensional species or a craft that they might perceive or a specific area in the galaxy or beyond the galaxy, etc. Some people actually use long range lasers as well and they point them up into the sky as they are meditating or visualizing or concentrating really hard on their coordinates and at the same time issuing a call mentally for the aliens to please come. In fact, James Gilliland, I think his name is James, but I know his last name is Gilliland, who's out there in Washington, he's got a ranch and he takes people out all the time and they've got their pointers, they've got their night vision goggles, they're sending this information to the aliens and he claims that there's all kinds of cool evidences that are happening as a result. In my experience, it's not that hard if you're open and you're not chasing it. What do I mean by chasing it? Some people want to have a spiritual encounter so bad that all they do is wonder when it's going to happen and ask themselves, why hasn't it happened yet? What they're actually doing is projecting a hard energy, that hard energy of needing something to happen. That hard energy isn't high vibration. It will actually repel that which you are trying to call to. So there has to be a state of ease when we talk to aliens. There has to be a flow and we have to be open to it. But please keep in mind, if you're going to call to an alien, write it down, use your coordinates, get a laser pointer, you want to make sure that you know what kind of interdimensional you want to have contact with. When I first put out that call, and yes, I did do that, probably about 10, maybe seven to 10 years ago. When I first did it though, I was very specific. I asked for service to others only, benevolent 
beings only, beings that exist in 5D or higher, beings that exist to serve source energy, beings that are within the light and within the love. And I made it clear in that call that I would not entertain any beings that were not of the light. So don't even try it. I actually believe that being clear and providing these kinds of parameters will help us to attract the right type of being to have an interaction with. But again, it's just talking. It's just asking. It's making yourself available. But aliens aren't angels. Aliens aren't your spirit guide. Aliens aren't that cool panther that exists as your spirit animal that's always tracking you wherever you go. Aliens have a mind of their own. They got their own gig and they're doing their own thing. So they either will or they won't. Don't get pressed about it. Just have an ease about it and hopefully it will happen. This question comes from Nicole O. And I chose this question because it's in keeping with some of the other things that we've already talked about. She says, Dear Crystal, I have done all kinds of research already about my question and found almost nothing helpful on the internet, so I hope you can help me. About a week ago, as I lay in bed, I asked the angels to come to me in my dreams. I felt a fullness in my chest. It felt like I might pop out of my body for a few minutes, but I didn't. I vaguely saw a presence begin to appear, and after some time I got the impression that angels were working on me so fast that I couldn't make out exactly what was happening. It seemed like they were doing surgery on my light body or my aura. Then it got even weirder. They would carefully reach inside me and pull out what looked like black shards, and I would feel a twinge as they were extracted. They did this about five times. Can you please explain to me what happened? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I might be able to. And I chose your question, Nicole, because I've had a similar experience, though my experience was with interdimensionals. The specific interdimensionals I had the experience with were the Arcturians. Edgar Casey called Arcturus the most advanced civilization in our galaxy, and not just technologically, but in terms of energy and vibration. High level, high vibration, 5D and higher interdimensionals are commonly mistaken as angels. And I'm not suggesting that these beings were not angels, but I am saying that I wouldn't be surprised if they were very, very high level interdimensionals. Now let me tell you what happened to me many years ago because it's really similar and I think probably the same thing was happening to you. There was a period of time, probably about a month, maybe a little longer than a month, that I would have these weird electric currents that would rush and stream all over my body. And they were so intense that when I was trying to go to sleep, they would zap me awake. And they were so intense that they would take my breath away. I thought often that I was probably having a heart attack or maybe a stroke or something crazy was happening. And so I went to the doctor and I checked it out, which I always recommend, by the way, if you're experiencing any kind of weird anomalous symptoms and you think it's spirit, just make sure you go to the doctor and make sure it's not a problem. It wasn't a problem in my case. And the electric sensations continued until one night I had been sleeping peacefully when all of a sudden I felt a jolt, a huge jolt, a shock really, of electricity. And it woke me right up and I sat up in bed. And at this point, I'm awake. I'm an experienced enough astral traveler that if I'm out of my body, I check out myself in the bed and I make sure that my body's there. And so when I woke up from that zap, I made sure that I was not out of body because what I saw at the side of my bed is something that I would expect to see in different dimensions. There on the side of my bed were three beings, probably about four and a half feet tall, four, four and a half feet tall. They had what looked like robes or cloaks on, and these cloaks had hoods. And I could barely see their face, but I could see this kind of bluish incandescent light emanating from beneath the hood. And at one point, one of them sort of turned in my direction to where I was sitting and I could see their face. And how do I describe this? It, it looked like glass almost. There was a diffused glow to it, but it looked as if they were lit up from the inside, almost like lamplight. And they had these glassy, very beautiful sapphire blue 
faces. And what they were doing was standing at the edge of my bed and they were running their quote unquote arms, because I couldn't really see what those look like, up and down my body. And wherever their hands went, I felt that jolting electric current. And so I asked them, what are you doing? And I received a one word answer. And they said, attunements. And at the time, I did not know what that was. And so I said, okay, so what's an attunement? And they proceeded to communicate with me and explain what that was, but they did so telepathically. Telepathically means they were communicating through the mind. So this was not something that was happening with the English language or with sound as we know it. They were sending images into my pineal gland or into my third eye, and that's how I received it. And they were showing me that they were making adjustments to my various systems, body, mind, and spirit. All these systems, again, flow into into the others and they work synergistically and what they told me was that they wished to work with me however at my present state in my present energetic composition they were unable to do so because I was not a match for them my body my mind and my spirit could not hold their energy due to the vibration so they were moving things around and the energy fluctuations that I felt were the areas in which they were making these modifications after that encounter and by the way I saw them once but those nightly electric current things continued to happen for weeks after after that, but shortly after the experience with them on the side of my bed, I began to channel them. The reason they were there is because they wanted to do a specific quality of work with me, but I wasn't a match for it, so they were making me a match for it. I highly suspect, Nicole, that this is similar to what they're doing for you. They are adjusting you. They are attuning you. They are bringing you into alignment so that you can have interactions with them and so that your systems all interlocked together can hold and run and understand their energy and potentially express their energy. They might want to channel through you. They might want to give you information that you are supposed to then give someone else or express out from yourself. But you cannot do this unless you are a match for their energy. Now, this reaching inside of you and pulling these black shards out of you reminds me of Jim Sparks. And Jim Sparks is that alien abductee. And he talked about an incident with aliens once where they put him on a table and they reached inside of him, although I think they used an instrument of some sort, into his lungs. And they extracted this huge globule of black gunk and they showed it to him. And essentially, to make a long story short, this is the stuff that was in his lungs as a result of a lifetime of smoking, and they just removed it, and he was returned in that moment to health. So this description you give reminds me of what happened to Jim Sparks, but it could be something they're doing in conjunction with their modifications and their attunements. My best advice for you, Nicole, is that you ask spirit to reveal to you what is happening to you. Let spirit know that you're open to becoming a match for higher vibration information and for interaction with beings that exist within the light and within the love. Let spirit know that you would like some clarity around what is happening so that you can actively partner with whatever it is that they're doing. Spirit usually will answer these types of questions. This may come either in the form of a dream or through repetitive patterns that start happening around you, but they will try to get that information to you so that you can say, yes, I want to be a part of this. I want more of this. Now, I'm not sensing from your letter that you were afraid, and I don't think you have to be. I think this is exactly what was happening to me, maybe not the same beings, but probably for a similar reason. And I have to tell you, as soon as this did happen in my life, it took my spirituality and my consciousness to a whole other level. So you should be excited. All right, folks, this is our last question for the podcast, and it comes in from Shelly G. She's actually a member of the Lightworkers Lab, a really wonderful person. And she says, my third eye won't open, and I feel like I'm doing all of the suggestions I've learned from many people. How can I open it? Well, first, I'd like to say 
it's awesome that you're actually doing what people are telling you that you should do. Because a lot of people just fact gather and they look for ways to amass information, but they never actually do the practices and the disciplines necessary to get the result that they want. So you are doing that and that's wonderful. Now, I just talked in a previous question about the four, I think it was four or five things that everybody needs to do if they want to expand their consciousness and reach the next level in their own enlightenment. And so I'm going to start by recommending that you do those things. And again, it's fellowship, it's study, it's disciplines, and it's practices, and it's high vibration food and hydration. Those four things are key. The high vibration food and hydration in particular really do allow the pineal gland, which is that interface between the spirit world and the physical world, to self-correct and return itself to health. And when the pineal gland is healthy and vibrating, that's when the doors of perception open to us. So the food and the water is really important. But I won't go back into all of those things because we've already talked about it. But I do want to give you a little meditation that you might like to try. It's very simple, but it's not necessarily easy. And the reason it's not easy is because you may experience symptoms of third eye awakening as a result of doing this meditation, and they can be a little uncomfortable. Essentially, what you want to do is get yourself into a profound state of relaxation, a profound state of neutrality. This is typically achieved as a result of meditation. So maybe what you want to do is meditate for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes and get into that really deep state of relaxation. Once you're there and with your eyes closed, what I want you to do is take both of your eyes behind your closed lids and look up to the area in the center of your two eyebrows. This is the area of the third eye energetic center or the third eye chakra. So that's where we're looking. It's kind of causing our eyeballs to cross a little bit, but that's what we have to do. Once you're looking at this area between your brows, what you want to do is hold your eyes there. Again, this is simple, but it is not easy because if you haven't done this meditation before, you'll find that your eyes will experience fatigue. And when you first start off, it's not uncommon that you can only maintain that position for a minute and sometimes less than a minute. But if you keep with this meditation, in fact, if you do this like two or three times a day, maybe anywhere from three to five to 10 minutes or longer, if you can, this really begins to open up this energetic center. You know, in Ginger Snap's question, when I told her to focus on her palms and the palms started to activate, the palms started to tingle and to get warm. What she was doing in that exercise was opening an energetic center as a result of consciousness activation. And this is now exactly what you're doing. We are sending our concentration and our energy. We are sending our awareness and our focus directly to the area between the two brows. And we are keeping it there for as long as possible. Now, one thing you might want to graft onto this meditation at some point is actually the visualization of an eye. And so as your eyes are closed and as you're looking up to this third eye area, actually visualize an eye there. It can be your eye. It could be the eye of Horus. It could be whatever eye. But this eye is going to signify the third eye and it's going to connect to your third eye. What I want you to do is just hang out with that visualization as you continue to look in this area for as long as you can. You might want to even practice with the eye. You might want to visualize the eye closing, the lashes falling, and then the eye opening again, and then closing, and then opening again. This is you literally practicing opening your third eye and closing it. Once this visualization is strong, then I would recommend you keep that third eye open and consciously activate. Send your energy in a stream to your third eye. This will open your third eye. Now, does that guarantee that the third eye stays open? No, but if you have a lifestyle, not unlike what we've just discussed with the four fundamentals that I would like for you to do, you will open your third eye and you will keep that third eye open. The last thing I want to mention is that if you do this meditation, 
Do not be surprised if you feel pressure in the area of the third eye. It sometimes feels like there's a finger or a hand right over that particular area. Other people feel zaps in their head and can even have twinges of pain or an outright headache. Those are classic symptoms of third eye opening. And if you feel that, even though it might be uncomfortable, this is a signal that you're doing it right. Well, all right, those were awesome, awesome questions. Thank you guys again for thinking about some really cool questions that not just you want the answer to, but also a lot of other people would have never even thought to ask some of these questions and really want to hear the answers as well. So thank you for taking the time to write them and to giving me this awesome content for the Lightworkers Lab podcast. Now, before we conclude, let me very quickly give you some really awesome good news, especially for those of you out there who want to take one of my classes. I get letters from people on all sorts of different things, but I get a lot of letters from people who just want to take one of my classes, but they can't afford it, or there's something going on in their life, and it's just not feasible for some reason. Well, last week in the Lightworkers Lab, which again is my membership site private group, we had a very generous benefactor step up, who prefers to remain anonymous, by the way, and offer five scholarships to five people out there who might want to take one of my classes but cannot afford to do so. Five scholarships! That is so awesome, and I feel really, really honored. And I want you to think about it. If this sounds like you, what I want you to do is write me at scholarships, plural, at crystallandcompton.com. That's scholarships at crystallandcompton.com. I want to know who you are. I want to know why you think you're a match for a scholarship at this time. And I also want you to tell me what class you'd like to take because I have four that I offer. Very briefly, people, let me go through these four classes because some of you out there I know are going to want to apply for the scholarship. The first class is called Everything Psychic. It is a 14-hour, comprehensive, kooky, awesome, rad class in which I try to teach absolutely everything that I know about metaphysics. And, And we're talking about from the basics of mind control and controlling your thoughts and inner narratives, all the way to ascended masters and aliens and grids and interdimensional travel. And in the middle, we've got your clairs, your clairvoyance, your clairsentience. We've got your third eye, your pineal. We've got divination. We've got EVP. We've got shadow people. We've got everything. It is a class that's perfect for somebody who's ready to know more. They're ready to just hit that next level in their spiritual advancement and in their enlightenment. Again, 14 hours. There's a lot of supplemental material. And if you're interested in receiving a scholarship for this class, well, you know where to write me and mention the class Everything Psychic. The next class that we also have is Supercharge Your Life with Symbols. It deals primarily with the principles of manifestation, but as they are specific to symbols and symbology. And we source symbols out of ancient systems. We create our own symbols. We learn to channel symbols. And it's kind of a sophisticated class. Um, I don't know that it would be for the beginner per se, but it was a very good class, probably about five or six hours with supplemental handouts that I think a lot of people out there would enjoy. The next class is my favorite to date. It's called All About Angels, and in it I teach you, well, all about angels. I need to get a little more (laughs) unique with these titles. I'm thinking everything psychic and all about angels. But in it I teach you about your guardian angels, your situational angels, your theme angels. I teach you about who the archangels really are because it's not what we've been taught all of these years. And I also go into a vision that I had with the archangels that really changed my life. And I teach you how to raise your vibration so you can level up to the position of the angels and have communication with them, teach you how to channel them. I just, there's, it's all about angels, which is why I named it that. And if you're interested in that, course and and perhaps want to get a scholarship, then make sure to name that class in your email. 
Last but not least is the class that is coming up in about six weeks. Presently, it's October 2016. I'm not sure when you're listening to this, but this class is scheduled to start on December 9th, 2016, and it's called The Blueprint. How to turn your talents into a service that you can sell. Now, this is a little bit of a switching of the gears for me, but I love it. I love lightworkers. I love people who are getting activated right now. And there are so many of you out there. I believe spirit and in specific, Metatron, is combing the world right now for the healers, for the intuitives, for the hypnotherapists, for the encouragers, for the regular therapists, for the acupuncturists, for the people who work with energy, for the mediums. Spirit is looking for people who are connected and who are in touch with their raw talents and abilities. These are the people we would call light workers. You've come into this world at this time to work in the light and to do your thing like only you can do it. Now, this is a class for you if you haven't yet gone into business for yourself. If you haven't yet pulled all of this energy of your light work into form and created a service out of it. I'm super excited about this class because I'm going to teach my students how I went from $15 a session, because like so many other lightworkers, I totally doubted myself and undervalued myself, all the way to $300 a session. And I even sold packages in the thousands of dollars. And I was busy, people. I raised my rates so that I wouldn't be busy. And I just got busier. And I followed a blueprint in order to do that and in order to have that. And that's the blueprint I'm going to share with people in this class. So if that sounds like you, and I bet there are a lot of people out there who would love a scholarship to this class because this is going to teach you how to start and how to get going on the road to abundance. If you're resonating to this, then go ahead and send me that email to scholarships at crystallancompton.com and reference the class, The Blueprint. Okay, The Blueprint. To recap, we have everything psychic, supercharge your life with symbols, we have all about angels, and then we have The Blueprint, turning your talents into a service that you can sell. I just want to close by saying thank you so much to that benefactor. Thank you to all the people who are tuned in, connected, wanting to help and love one another. Thank you to the Lightworkers Lab. You guys are awesome, and I look forward to all of you out there who aren't members or who aren't a part of it joining because there's enough for everybody, baby. It's wonderful in there, and I would love to see you be a part of it. And on that note, I wish everybody out there all the love in the world, and I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. Thank you for listening to the Lightworkers Lab podcast. To learn more about Crystal Ann Compton, visit her website at www.crystalancompton.com or you can visit www.thelightworkerslab.com.